Well, we've just wrapped up the week. It was a really, really busy week. Today I worked 13 hours straight, not a single break. And I'll tell you a little bit about our week and we'll get into this week's Q&A. That's coming up next on The Urban Farmer. Well, we picked up a lot this week. We got slammed again, really busy, and there was a lot of lettuce transplants that went in on Wednesday, and that was really crucial because we were, they were almost getting late to put in, but we got them done, so that was great. Um, and I checked on them today, and they look fine. And I had a lot of people commenting, oh, geez, man, you're planting it into black landscape fabric. And you're right, it was risky, but we didn't have a choice. We had to do it. It's been 40 degrees Celsius every day since then. That day wasn't quite 40, maybe 36. So we've been, I've been running the drip irrigation twice a day. Runs it, it goes on at 2 p.m. and 2 a.m. And that's been working. So I went by today and was you know, the odd one here and there died, but I'd say it was a 75, uh, 95% success rate, so that's really great. We've got one more field planting of Salanova that's gonna happen. We're gonna seed those on Monday. Those will probably go out in the field in two weeks. Then the only Salanova I'll plant after that will be a greenhouse crop that will get interplanted into the tunnels by about maybe mid to late September and then that'll be it for the season. Anything I do after that will be in the big tunnel. Speaking about the big tunnel, put the shade cloth has been put on it and it's made a huge, huge difference. Unbelievable difference actually. Sorry if the sun's behind me there because it's in the evening. And it has reduced the temperature in here by 10 degrees Celsius during the day. That's fantastic because that means it's almost 10 degrees cooler in there than it is outside. So it's kind of surprising because you think, a green, how can a greenhouse be cooler? But it is. You can see even right now, it is, it's 35 Celsius in here. Today was 40. In fact, it's still 40 outside right now. So it's five degrees cooler in here at the moment. So that's worked out really good. Something I also did this week I want to show you guys. I, did so, I started doing something that I've seen my friend Chris Thoreau, who's a, a great microgreens grower, do. You put bricks. These are kind of like, they're like uh, eight inch by 18 inch cinder blocks, blocks. Put them on the flats and that weight is really evenly distributed. And I've got really nice edge to edge germination. So in seven years of doing microgreens, I'm just discovering this now, made a huge world of a difference. So greenhouse stuff is going really good right now. I wanna show you guys one more thing and then we'll get into this week's Q&A. Okay, one more thing I've done in my washing station. Again, I'm gonna make another video on this soon. I'm still kind of working out some of the kinks, so there's no point in me doing a full on one until I think I've got it more or less figured out. So just, so this is the washing bin where you see me bubbling greens. Beneath this, is a bigger tub, like this is a 75 gallon, the one beneath it is an 85 gallon. And when I drain this, it goes, it, the water catches into this big tub beneath it and in that tub there's a sub pump, a sump pump that pumps the water out to the front of my property and it gets dispersed amongst my trees and shrubs. The water from the washing table also drains into there. The problem we've had with this for a long time, it's not a problem, it's just something we have to maintain, which is really a really gross job, job, is you get all this sediment that builds up down there and it's literally slugs, bugs, and dirt washed off vegetables. It gets really nasty and I had to clean it out today. It's almost like cleaning a grease trap if any of you guys have worked at a restaurant. And I did two things to it that I'm very excited about, I'm gonna show you. So all of this, I'm gonna take this tub off and show you what I did beneath. This tub has a drain valve, and when I undo, when I loosen that, it drains down into the tub below, and all the debris also goes down there with it. So what I've done is I've put a piece of perforated big O pipe on it that goes down below and at the end of that a bit of shade cloth that I've done 
put over the end. So the idea is it's sort of a DIY filter that the water drains through it and all those particulates will get stuck in this chamber and then when I, when this water, um, so basically the idea is that I won't be capturing big particulates into the tub, meaning that I'll have to clean it a little bit less. So I'll show you how that goes. So here's what this tub looks like down below. When the water comes off of the washing table, it goes into a big planter pot that I've drilled some holes into and I've put a big piece of shade cloth around it. So the idea is you build up the nasty sludge in that and I can take that out and change it. And then this is the same idea, it's just a big tube with a piece of shade cloth on the end of it as well. And so when the water drains from the tub above it, it goes through this, which is a filter. And then when the water comes off the, the washing screen, it drains through that, which is a filter. So, and then my sub pump is down here. So you can hear it, I clip it on. That's pumping away water. I've also got a little nylon bag that's wrapped over that sub pump as well. And that's another level of filtration. So all of those things need to be cleaned at some point. Maybe once every two weeks, I've got to, you know, drain it all out and then take those screens and filters out. And here's one. I'm just laying it in the sun and letting all the, the dirt dry off it so that I can just flick that dirt back into the soil. Okay, that is that thing. And again, I'll show you guys that again. I know there's going to be more questions about it. Video will be coming soon about that whole thing, but like I said, I'm still working out the kinks, but I like sharing stuff with you guys because I really like the idea of just sharing information and maybe people can build off these ideas and make them better. And I know everybody's gonna make comments like, hey Curtis, have you thought of this? Why don't you try that? Why don't you try this? Why don't you try that? My challenge to you guys is you try it, you do it. You rebuild that, make it better. Send me a video, send me pictures, show me how you do it because sometimes you know, you're sitting there and you see something and you go, you got all these, these ideas, but if you're not actually doing it, sometimes those ideas aren't really worth much because you're just, you're not actually doing it. So you're not seeing all the nuances and things that happen with it when you're doing it. So I would encourage you guys to do this stuff, build the stuff that I do, rip it off, make it better and share it with me and share it with everybody else. Okay, let's do today's Q and A. First question of the week. Do you have any videos or blog posts discussing the double layer of poly um, with the air wrap of your passive solar greenhouse? So, uh, no, but let's go check it out. Okay, so this greenhouse has a double layer poly. So it's kind of like a balloon. There's a layer on the outside and there's a layer on the inside. And basically, it works, basically it works by just this little fan. This little fan runs 24 seven and it's sort of tuck taped with a little piece of um, that pipe that you use for your drying machine, cut into the plastic, tuck, tuck taped around it. That essentially just blows air between it 24 seven, seven days a week. Um, takes about as much power as a light bulb. So it's a small, it's a small cost for a really great effect because what it does is it gives me an R5 rating. So in the winter time, if it's minus 20 Celsius outside, I'll touch this plastic and it's warm. It's not cold. So that reduces condensation, but it also keeps the heat in better because we're not losing the heat as when it touches the plastic. Basically, like when I engineered this greenhouse or when we built it, we are, the plans were originally to put polycarbonate, thick like a three quarter inch polycarbonate all the way around, which is really heavy. That's why it's built so <laughs> strongly like this. But by the time we had, um, you know, mostly built the greenhouse, I was looking at the budget and we'd already gone over like 10,000 that I wanted to. So at that point I made a decision. I said, well, let's just do a blower instead of using the polycarbonate because the polycarbonate was going to cost $8,000 with shipping and taxes and everything. And then to run this blower and then get two layers of poly, cost altogether $300. I'm not, I'm not kidding you. So huge savings to have the same effect 
yes, I have to maybe spend $20 on electricity a year to run that, but it's still a huge savings. So basically, um, because this greenhouse is got a is bridged here with this piece I have to bridge the poly so I've got just like I just cut in these pieces that bridge it from the top to the bottom to keep the air inflated on top and bottom and then on the end there's an exhaust so right here there's just air blowing out of there it's releasing if you don't have a release the plastic will you know explode and it actually did one day in January I didn't have a release on it because some greenhouses, if you have enough channel lock surface area, it leaks out there, but this was so tight that it literally blew off the top. The channel lock all came undone. Mid-January, I came in here, this was wide open, it was a nightmare. Anyways, so that is, that's how the blower works. Okay, another question, and we'll just go and check the, um, the greenhouse out. Again, is um, I wanted to ask, what are your plans for the Paso Solar greenhouse? The space where you potted the tomatoes were, will you keep using it for tomato planting for winter, spring? Um, any plans of what you're going to plant there next summer? Or do you keep it empty during the summer? Good question, we'll go check that out as well. So in this space in the greenhouse, this is where we had our early season tomatoes. And the reason we did them in pots like this is because originally we were gonna do a raised bed and we still are, we just ran it, we didn't have time to do it. So putting these tomatoes in pots was just sort of an impromptu decision because I had excavated the soil from this greenhouse and moved it to another site. And the plan is to bring it back here. And we had started these tomatoes in January. I was in New Zealand at the time. And we didn't have, they were too big too quickly and we needed a place to put them. So I impromptu made a decision. Let's just go get some of that dirt, put it in pots and plant the tomatoes in there and see how they do. So uh, once we get some time later this summer or early fall, we'll be building a big three foot wide and about two and a half feet tall raised bed all along the front of this greenhouse, which will be sort of a winter garden for me, experimental garden in the winter, as well as growing some herbs and stuff like that that we're growing for sale. So that's the plan for that. And we are going to be putting down concrete on this floor. That's the next plan. This is just crush. So I'm gonna put down two foot by two foot concrete pavers down here. And uh, that w so that'll be like the next sort of finishing step. There's still lots to do on this greenhouse though. Okay, next question. Since you're traveling a lot, that's what I, th that's what I think, maybe I'm wrong, I do travel a lot. Um, can you share with us your opinion about the urban farming movement in the world? For me, especially in the US, absolutely, I can do that. How is it going for people who just started? How fast is it growing? What are the challenges? What are the opportunities? Where do you see it for the next X years from now? Okay, um, yeah, that's a, good, that's a good question. I see a lot happening in the US. I see a lot of really cool stuff happening in the US. Um, you know, one of the, uh, okay, well, let me just kind of go in, in order here. How is it going for people who just started? It depends, that's a broad question. Um, people who go in with the right knowledge are crushing it. People who go in thinking that they're going to reinvent the wheel and go against a lot of the things that I encourage people to do, like you don't have to buy land, you know, go in low overhead, but you gotta spend some money to start, you know. Some people go in and they don't wanna spend any money, they don't wanna buy a quick cut greens harvester, they don't wanna buy a soil working machine, they don't wanna put the time into uh, building a walk-in cooler or buying a walk-in cooler or what have you. Um, those that aren't spending the time and a bit of money to make those things happen, I don't see being successful that often. People that go in with the right stuff right out of the gate and a bit of the right knowledge and have a realistic idea of what their market wants and just go with that, I see those people succeeding all the time and often exceeding my expectations. And uh, that's not to say that there aren't people out there succeeding that uh, are kind of doing their own thing. There certainly are, but you know, there's a lot of good information out there about farming and you know you don't have to reinvent the wheel. So many people think that they want to just, I'm going to do it my way, I'm going to grow the crops that I want to grow and they don't do market research or they aren't realistic about just selling things like salad greens. Because you know a lot of people say, oh well you can't feed the world with salad greens and you're right. Um, but if you can make a good living growing salad greens, why wouldn't you grow salad greens? Why wouldn't you you know, meet a, a demand that's there. If there's a demand for salad greens, what's wrong with replacing local salad greens with stuff that comes from 
Mexico or California or somewhere far away from where you don't live. What's wrong with replacing that? If there's a demand for it, do it, you know? A lot of people have this moral hang up about growing high value crops, why? If there's a demand, grow it because at least you're replacing a, your local good from grown from the heart product with replacing that with something that was imported. So what's wrong with that? Anyways, I could rant on about that all day, but I think you get what I'm saying. Um, so how fast is it growing? Um, it feels like it's growing fast, but it's. I often feel like I'm in this little bubble and that I'm not really, you know, seeing the whole picture because you kind of get so surrounded with all these people that are like you and work like you and that's what I aim to do is surround myself with people that that think like me and work like me um, but sometimes you you kind of lose track of how the world might actually be I don't know it's hard for me to comment on how things are are, are growing but uh, I definitely see it growing I mean I'm, I'm getting requests to speak more than I ever have um, I'm seeing people doing this more than I ever have so that's all I can really go on if you're looking for statistical information maybe try like Google Analytics or something like that because um, I don't I don't know exactly but I think it's growing what are the challenges you know a lot of the challenges are the same things I see but um, you know one big challenge I see is regulatory bodies especially in parts of the US you know you've got law uh, rules like it's illegal to grow food in your own lawn or something like that some ridiculous things a lot of the food and safety, uh, uh, food safety regulations that really get in the way of farmers. The least regulation I see is in market gardeners because generally speaking, vegetables are considered low risk. So I don't see a ton of barriers to entry or regulations that are shutting farmers down in with, with that regard. Though I know they exist, I just don't see a lot of it like you do in dairy or eggs or if you're producing uh, meat products or things like that or value added products. Vegetables are generally the least uh, regulated that I've seen and I'm totally willing to accept that in some places I might be wrong but I'm just mean from from what I've seen throughout the US um, what are the opportunities well the opportunities are huge because one simple fact two simple facts less than 2% of the people in the world know how to farm today and the average age of a farmer is 65 that's where the opportunities are the fact that there's so few people farming tells you that there's a huge demand for this kind of thing and so get out there and crush it go do it um, where do you see it from 10 X years from now that's a tough one I mean so much is changing there's so much innovation right now especially because farmers like myself and many other farmers I know are sharing information online and we're using that to leverage one another's experiences and that's why you know I'm showing you guys the things that I'm working on not because I want to copyright them or have some kind of patent pending on some idea. Uh, not that I'm opposed to that, but just, you know, I want somebody to take my washing station and make it better and then tell me and show me how you made it better. So I think the, the, the growth of this movement is happening, is compounding like interest. It's like it's growing exponentially in a way because we're sharing these experiences and I'm talking to somebody in New Zealand who's doing the same thing and we're building off each other's experiences and growing. So I think the level of growth we're going to see is going to be a lot more than we have in the past because the technology of communication allows us to disseminate information so much quicker. So I'm really optimistic that things will accelerate a lot quicker from here on in. Okay. Last question is, do you use some kind of bag sealer machine? If so, what is it? Let's go check it out. All right, this is that bag sealer. So it's just a, I don't, it doesn't even have a brand name on it. Uh, oh, here it does. Oh no, that's the store I bought it from. So they're just, you get these at like retail stores, that, stores that equipped retail stores. So they have like little signs for hagging. They have shel shel shelving racks and things like that. I get this from the store that I buy my bags from, which is a local store called Lizgen. So they had this, I bought it there. So it allows us to seal bags. I'll show you how it works. So what, once you have a bag and you spin it closed, you just, you have it twisted like this and you just run it through there and it just seals the bag with a little piece of tape. It's a pretty handy thing because it probably saves us at least a few seconds every bag we tie. So if you think about that we do tens of thousands of bags a year, 
whether it's stuff to the farmer's market or restaurants, that's a lot of time saved. If you guys have found that stuff helpful, please hit the subscribe button right now. Like and share these videos with your friends and check out my online course, ProfitableUrbanFarming.com and my book at TheUrbanFarmer.co. And if you'd like to make a donation to the show, it's much appreciated and always welcome. You can do that at TheUrbanFarmer.co slash support. All right, see you next time.